Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of Wiggle Wednesday. It's been a few weeks. Um, just back from Jamaica yesterday, had a long day traveling, so I'm still a bit tired today, so I'm not super chipper, but um, we're going to go into the uh, basics of the soil food web today, so I hope everybody's excited. I'll give a few minutes here to uh, let a few more people join in here. Welcome, Scott, from Central Kansas, East Central Kansas, and we have Carol from Atlanta. Um, yeah, so I went from 80, 90 degrees to 40, 50 degrees here in Pennsylvania. Winter set in here. Uh, big change and big culture change, too. Um, and we got Thanksgiving coming up for everyone in uh, the United States here. So I hope you're ready for Thanksgiving and a big holiday. And hopefully you're going to eat your leftovers, but give them to the worms if you've got any extras. Uh, hello, Facebook user. It doesn't say your name, but hello. And we've got William from uh, Cleveland, Ohio. All right, I'm going to get into it here. And uh, like last time, we finally figured out a way that we can do the presentation on uh, StreamYard here. And uh, you can still see me and do the presentation at the same time. So let me make sure I'm getting rid of banners here. Uh, I'm not going to be able to see your comments, so if you do have questions that you post throughout the uh, presentation here, I will see them at the end and be able to answer questions that you posted throughout the presentation at the end. And then for any more questions that do come up, uh, I'll get to those as well. So, hey, Susan from Susan or Suzanne uh, from New Zealand. Welcome. Glad to see somebody from New Zealand. All right, let me get rid of the banner here and we'll get going into the basics of the soil food web. One second here. I just got to get rid of the lower one here so you can see the entire presentation. All right, and I'm going to switch over to here. So today we're going to be talking about the basics of the soil food web. So all these microorganisms that are in soils composts, worm bins that are doing the decomposition alongside worms. So worms are helping them and they are, and these microorganisms are doing the main decomposition along with a number of other functions, which we are going to talk about. Let me make this big real quick so I can see it a bit better. All right, so soil food web basics. Uh, in nature, worms are higher up on the food chain and we're gonna show an illustration here in just a second of the soil food web and uh, kind of how it's the start of the food chain. So they help to transfer energy and reduce particle size. Uh, and the real heroes are the microbes at the base of it all. So worms are chewing through material, increasing, or sorry, decreasing particle size, increasing surface area so that bacteria and fungi can move in and decompose it. Um, so, this uh, microorganisms are at the base of it all. We're going to be talking about what the characters of the soil food web are. So what those little microorganisms are and what they do. To start off, we're going to talk about bacteria. Then we'll talk about fungi. I've got some good pictures mixed in here. Uh, protozoa, nematodes. And then we're going to talk about the functions, how these things work in the soil with plants uh, and have a symbiotic relationship with plants. And then we'll discuss the uh, all the functions performed within soils, or um, when I mention soils, I also mean you know worm bins, compost piles, anything where organic matter is breaking down. And then at the end, we're going to go through our Q and A. So this is an illustration of the characters of the soil food web. Uh, this is a pretty well known illustration. Some of you may have seen this before. Uh, for those of you that are new. Uh, like I said, this is basically the start of the food chain. So us humans are very far, very far up on the food chain where, you know, we're eating a lot of lower organisms. And this is the very start of all that where the process begins and uh, energy is transferred up to higher trophic levels. So what it all starts with is sunlight, oxygen and water providing photosynthesis for plants. So plants are photosynthesizing. I think we all learned this in biology and I don't know to need to go into the details of that, but uh, through photosynthesis, the major point that I wanna make is that plants are creating energy that they're not only using for themselves to grow, but usually there's making, not, I should not say usually, they're always making extra, extra foods, uh, especially carbohydrates, proteins, sugars, that they are sending out through their roots. So, they're using some of the energy, but 
the majority of the energy is actually getting put out through plant roots to feed especially bacteria and fungi. So they're trying to attract microorganisms to the root zone so that um, nutrients are cycled and then they're able to take up those nutrients in a plant available form. So like um, uh, just as an example, just to kind of give you, you know, how are sugars in plants? You know, we think about maple syrup. Uh, we get maple syrup from trees. So sap in all there, there is sap in all types of plants. Some happen to have more sugars like the maple syrup that we take from trees, but all plants are going to have sugars. Uh, so they're, they're producing these sugars, which are carbohydrates that they're putting out through their roots. And so they're photosynthesizing, uh, putting out foods through their roots. I'm going to use my pointer here. And along with uh, putting out root exudates is what they're called through the roots to feed soil biology. These plants are also gonna be providing dead organic matter by sloughing off dead cells from the roots or also any, um, any uh, above ground plant matter that's terminated or dies is gonna eventually provide organic matter. So the preferred foods for these bacteria and fungi are gonna be root exudates or organic matter. So we've got that first trophic level of photosynthesizers and then the very first decomposers are going to be bacteria and fungi uh, i like to use the analogy of um let's say a sandwich so people will make a sandwich eat half of the sandwich leave the other half on a plate i'm not saying that you do this but let's say i know that everyone uh, knows how this works so that's why it's a good analogy but if you leave the other half of the sandwich on your plate and leave it out in the counter especially in the summertime when it's warmer and hotter. After two or three days, you're going to have mold and bacteria that are starting to break those that sandwich down and make it really nasty. So we've got bacteria and fungi everywhere in nature, in the air, on us, in us, on plants, in plants. Um, and so they are coming in and breaking down that sandwich. So it's just the exact same thing in nature. If you've got a forest, where leaves fall down, sticks fall down, dead grasses fall down. All those things are gonna be decomposed by bacteria and fungi that are gonna be in the air and on surfaces already. So they're gonna break those things down. And as bacteria and fungi break down the uh, organic matter, they're gonna be using some of the nutrients and micronutrients from that to perform their own functions, their own needs to grow uh, and reproduce but there's gonna be excess nutrients, just like when we eat a chicken sandwich, uh, we use up some of the nutrients from that chicken sandwich, but there's gonna be excess that's gonna be held in our muscles and our bodies. So same thing with bacteria and fungi, they're gonna store these excess nutrients. With bacteria, it's especially nitrogen. Uh, we're gonna get into more details of this, but uh, as they're predators, and then this is the important part, is the predator-prey relationship between uh, bacteria and fungi, which are these first decomposers, and they're predators who are going to move in and eat them. So as they poop them out, they're going to release the excess nutrients in a plant available form. So these plants put out root exudates to attract bacteria and fungi to the root zone. The bacteria and fungi are there eating, uh, holding in excess nutrients. And then their predators come along and eat them, poop them out. It's called the poop loop. Uh, and so they're making those nutrients available or cycling nutrients to the plants. And plants and uh, soil microorganisms have these symbiotic relationships everywhere. Where plants are feeding microbes and microbes are helping to feed plants. So we've got, uh, real quickly, before we move on to the next slide, we've got plants photosynthesizing, bacteria and fungi moving in to decompose them, predator-prey relationships of protozoa and nematodes, which are going to eat the bacteria and fungi. And we're going to get into the details of all this as we move along. And then up from there, we move up the food chain or the food web. And it's called a food web because it's not necessarily linear, but we have some higher trophic levels that are eating lower trophic levels, but may also get eaten by other species of the lower trophic levels. So like nematodes are gonna eat bacteria, but they're also gonna get eaten by other nematodes or other organisms. Uh, so it's more of a web rather than a linear chain. Moving on. So first up, we have bacteria. Bacteria are everywhere. Like I said, you know, we've got bacteria all over our bodies, floating in the air, on surfaces of, you know, your kitchen. There's uh, everywhere is bacteria. 
Uh, when I'm looking through the microscope to check them out, the shapes that I'm seeing of bacteria are going to be mostly rod or cocci shape. Cocci shape is a round shape, so uh, round or rod shape bacteria. Bacteria are going to consume low carbon to nitrogen ratio foods. So in our compost pile, this would be considered the green material, things that have more nitrogen in them and don't have a ton of carbonaceous material like lignans and cellulose and things like that. So picture things that break down rather easily. So if you were to leave this out for several days, is it going to remain in shape and take a long time to break down? Or is it going to quickly uh, decompose and rot and just like thinking, you know, food scraps versus a wood chips? Food scraps are going to break down really quickly. So those are going to be bacterial foods. Um, what, since we're people are normally putting a good amount of greens into um, worm bins, that's why we have higher, especially higher populations of bacteria in vermicompost rather than uh, some more fungi uh, due to the foods that are fed uh, vermicompost bins. So um, we'll talk about fungi in just a second here, but by uh, adjusting the ratios of the greens to browns, you can be feeding uh, trying to feed more bacteria or trying to feed more fungi within a compost pile or vermicompost bin. So uh, bacteria require moisture for diffusion. Most bacteria rely on diffusion for uptake of nutrients. Bacteria and fungi don't have mouths like mammals where they're going around and munching things and swallowing them, but rather they're releasing enzymes. So uh, Let's say that I'm a bacteria and I want to eat this glass. You know, I come up to the glass, release some enzymes to it, turn it into a sloppy slime, and then I'm able to absorb it through my cells. That's what diffusion is. And this process requires those enzymes, but especially require moisture. Um, if the moisture is not there, then this material is completely dry and they're not able to do this process or this function. And so that's why it's especially important for us to have moisture in a worm bin because then we're helping to uh, helping the bacteria to function and do what they need to do to eat and reproduce. So I mentioned enzymes that uh, bacteria release enzymes in order to consume foods or organic matter. Um, these enzymes are going to be alkaline in nature. So for people who pay attention to pH in a compost pile, vermicompost bin, or I've even had people tell me that they pay attention to pH when they're making compost tea. Um, so when people are making compost tea, they'll no notice a rise in the alkalinity. And that's because you're getting an expansion of the population of bacteria, which are uh, releasing these enzymes to consume matter. So you're, that's why uh, you are going more alkaline. Or same thing in soils, if you're testing a soil, um, that alkalinity, a lot of that alkalinity is due to the bacteria that's in the soil. So then what is important is the, like I said, the predator prey relationship. So if we've got bacteria and fungi in the soil and they're holding all these excess nutrients, that's great. But this, these excess nutrients aren't being released to plants if we don't have their predators in place to be eating the uh, bacteria or fungi. So with bacteria, they are going to be mainly eaten by protozoa um, there's also a nematode, bacterial feeding nematode um, that goes through soils and eats them. And they're going to, like I said, have the poop loop where they're pooping uh, bacteria out and releasing those excess, excess nutrients. Um, and like I mentioned a few minutes ago, bacteria are especially holding extra nitrogen. And so in soils, um, they are going to be helping to cycle nitrogen to all of our plants. Um, and there was one thing I was just going to say, and I totally blanked on it after I said it, or after I was thinking it. Um, give me 10 seconds here. Cycle nutrients. Uh, oh, yes. I was going to say that the most, you may have heard me mention this in other live streams uh, or in other presentations, but the most nutrients in the world in soils are held in microorganisms. And that's an extremely important point. So I like to repeat it always, is that the most nutrients in the world and soils are held in microorganisms. So it's not a matter of using chemical fertilizers. It's a matter of releasing the nutrients that we already have in soils by uh, adding more life to the soils and making it available, making them available to plants. So that is bacteria. And now we're going to move on to fungi. So 
Uh, bacteria, I said, is a primary decomposer. Fungi is a primary decomposer. Both, both of these are the main things that are decomposing organic matter in a worm bin, in a compost pile, in soils, uh, in leaf litter, all kinds of things like that. So fungi are responsible for decomposing trees and woody material in nature. Um, the main things that are going to be breaking down dead and decaying matter are saprophytic fungi. So in our worm bins and in compost, we are going to have what's called saprophytic fungi. There's also mycorrhizal fungi, and I'm going to mention that in a second. But I want to make sure that people understand that there are, well, in soils, there's saprophytic fungi, there are mycorrhizal fungi, and there are pathogenic fungi. We're hoping to not really have much pathogenic fungi. We're going to have a lot more of the beneficial saprophytic and mycorrhizal fungi. But um, in our compost bins, we're going to be uh, pretty much dealing with saprophytic fungi, and I'll explain more in a second. So these fungi are going to consume higher carbon to nitrogen ratio foods. So the browns in a compost bin, sticks, stalks, leaves, cardboard, paper, uh, anything that has gone dormant and turned brown and been cut when it's brown. Um, so things that have more cellulose, lignin, harder to break down uh, cellular matter that these fungi are going to grow through and break them down. So if you've ever seen a rotting log or just a dead log that's laying down and you see mushrooms coming off of it, those mushrooms are the fruiting bodies of fungi. And it means that that log is filled with fungal hyphae that is usually microscopic that you're not even going to see inside the log. And then the conditions have been right where um, they were allowed to fruit. And so you see mushrooms coming off of them. So those logs are filled with saprophytic fungi that are growing through, breaking down all the cells in that wood. Um, so moisture is important in those things and because the moisture is going to help to loosen loosen up the cellulose and woody matter and carbonaceous material, also allowing fungi to come in and uh, take over and grow on and decompose that woody material in a bin, in soils, things like that. So through their functions, uh, both saprophytic fungi or mycorrhizal fungi in the soil are going to be releasing acids and enzymes, but especially more acids. So they're uh, my finger is a fungal hyphae moving through the soil, breaking things down. So it's releasing acids at the end here as it, you know, comes across a rock or something like that. It needs to penetrate that rock. So it'll release acids to break that down, penetrate into the rock or whatever it is that it's moving through the soil. So due to this release of acids, um, that's why. So when I say that, like a compost tea, when people are measuring the pH, they may see a rise, rise in the number and, things are going more alkaline where uh, with things that have more fungi in them, you're going to have more uh, lower pH numbers and be more acidic. Um, so when people talk about, uh, let's say blueberries, for example, blueberries are in a forest system and they need more acidic soils. People say that they need more acidic soils. Um, what they actually need are more fungi in the soil because more fungi are going to release more acids and uh, more fungi are going to be in a forest system, just like where you'll find blueberries in the wild. So uh, when people say that, you know, they need to be purchasing a certain fertilizer to provide more acidic conditions for blueberries or certain plants, I believe azaleas are another one. Um, in actuality, it's going to be best to have more fungi in the soil, which are going to be releasing these acids naturally. So fungi in soil are going to be eaten by nematodes. So there's a fungal feeding nematode. You're going to see a cool picture of that. And other higher trophic levels, so larger uh, organisms like arthropods, worms, anything else that's moving, chewing through the soil that's going to break up. So we've got fungal hyphae that are growing as threads, microscopic threads throughout the soil. And anything that's moving through there and munching through are going to be chewing on fungal hyphae. So um, any type of larger organism. Uh, so as I said, bacteria releases more nitrogen. Um, fungi actually are going to help to cycle more phosphorus and potassium along with other nutrients and micronutrients. And then as I mentioned, mushrooms, when people 
Uh, most people, when they think of mushrooms, they think, or sorry, fungi, they think of mushrooms and mushrooms are the fruiting bodies of different types of fungi. So uh, saprophytic fungi are like when you're growing oyster mushrooms or uh, shiitake mushrooms, those are both going to be saprophytic fungi. You're putting this uh, spawn into a substrate that's a woody substrate or a grainy substrate that they're going to grow out and break down. Um, mycorrhizal fungi, uh, I don't want to get into the details of it. Some of them do produce, uh, some mycorrhizal fungi do produce fruiting bodies and some of them just produce spores within the ground. Uh, we did just release an article about mycorrhizal fungi. So if you want to learn more about that, check out our website under the blogs. And it's a brand new article all about mycorrhizal fungi that goes in depth. The thing about mycorrhizal fungi, one second, excuse me, one second. I see a lot of social media posts and hear people making educational videos and calling all of mycelium. Mycelium in the ground is uh, fungal hyphae that have overlapped enough that they're somewhat visible. Those are called mycelium. And people seem to um, have a large misunderstanding that mycelium is mycorrhizal fungi. And their mycorrhizal fungi do have hyphae that make up mycelium. But most of the mycelium that you're going to see, which is these overlapping hyphae in a compost pile, they're going to be saprophytic fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi, and I know these are all new and big terms for you, and it might get confusing, so I'm trying to speak slow and allow you to kind of absorb it. Mycorrhizal fungi are what are called obligate symbionts, meaning they need a living host plant. So they need living roots to connect with in order to live. And in compost piles, we don't have living plants. We've got dead organic matter, which saprophytes love. We don't have living roots that mycorrhizal fungi are gonna connect with. So when you see hyphae in your compost pile or worm bin, it is not mycorrhizal fungi. It is saprophytic fungi because it's growing on dead decaying matter. And I just really wanna get that point across because it is so mixed up that people really uh, do don't quite grasp that often. Uh, so you may have spores in your compost pile from mycorrhizal fungi, which you're not likely going to see with a microscope because they need to be dyed, uh, dyed a certain color for you to be able to see them. Um, but again, mycorrhizal fungi need a living host. So they're gonna be uh, in soils, but not compost piles. In compost piles or uh, worm bins, you're gonna have saprophytic fungi. Sorry to beat that like a dead horse. All right, so here's a picture. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, on the right-hand side here, you've got a microscopic picture of uh, fungal hyphae. So I'll use my pointer here. Um, up towards the top here, you can see the cell wall. So here's a cell wall, cell wall, cell wall, cell wall. They're all uniform um, in size. So that's what. Uh, that's one thing that helps me distinguish that it's a fungal hyphae. They also are uniform in diameter here. So you've got two different strands here and you're not all of the parts are in focus because there's different depths to the, to the drop of water that I was looking at with this uh, fungal hyphae in there. But um, they basically look like tree branches. So once they start to branch out, it looks like a root system on a plant or a branching uh, above ground part of a tree. Uh, so it's interesting that they make connections with trees and other plants because they look, they grow in the same manner. All right, so we went over bacteria and fungi. Both of those are primary decomposers, decomposing organic matter. Then we move on to their predators after this picture. Sorry, I forgot about this. So this is saprophytic fungi. This is a large uh, compost pile on a, uh, I worked at a large scale composting facility and this is a handful that I grabbed. These are wood chips. So you've got a big, big wood chip here. Here's a piece of leaf, more woody matter. All of that woody stuff is covered with mycelium of saprophytic fungi. So that saprophytic fungi that is growing out, consuming that matter, it's going to slowly eat away at it and turn it to soil. So after bacteria and fungi, we've got predators, which are protozoa. So different types of protozoa are going to be responsible for cycling nutrients from bacteria. So they're going to be moving through soils either slowly or quickly. 
and uh, eating away a bacteria, munching away a bacteria, and uh, cycling nutrients from them. So the different types of, of protozoa that we have are amoeba, flagellates, and ciliates. Among amoeba, we have testate amoeba, uh, that, which have a test or shell. The picture here shows a testate amoeba. Looks like an olive because we've got a, a oval shape with one end that's somewhat flattened. That's gonna be their mouth end. Uh, sometimes you'll see their inner bodies come out of the shell and uh, it looks like they're twins right next to each other, but it's actually the body that's coming out and uh, eating on bacteria. So some of the bacteria that you see inside here, uh, some of it's just see-through, but some of it's gonna be bacteria that this uh, testate amoeba have eaten. Uh, so along with testate amoeba, we're gonna have naked amoeba, which are very similar, but they do not have a shell. So they're gonna be look, look like a blob. When I'm looking through the microscope, they don't have a, a definite shape. Um, they are gonna be moving through, they have a pseudopod, kind of like the blob in the 1950s movies where it reaches, grabs hold and pulls itself along slowly through soil matter or uh, any type of uh, organic matter. Then along with amoeba, we've got flagellates. So flagellates have a flagella, which is a whip-like tail that they use to move through soils. Um, I always try to think of some other type of uh, flagellate, but um, the best example that comes to mind is a sperm. So most people know a sperm as a, a body with a whip-like tail that swims through solution. And uh, so flagellates are gonna move that same way where they're using their tail to swim through, eat up bacteria. And so you'll see them like in, in I, I was looking uh, at the, through the microscope here, you would see them bumbling around where they're kind of moving like this, eating bacteria, moving down here, bumbling around, eating bacteria, and they just kind of move slowly through a sample. And then we've got ciliates. So ciliates, uh, so I couldn't really get pictures of flagellates or ciliates because of the way they move. It's, it's a bit difficult. Uh, ciliates move especially fast. Ciliates are called, uh, are what are known as uh, facultative anaerobes. So they can live in both anaerobic conditions and aerobic conditions, but they tend to prefer anaerobic conditions. So when I'm looking at a so soil sample, vermicompost sample, a tea sample, anything like that, I'm not wanting to see ciliates. So if I see them, that's a sign that things have gone anaerobic or there are very low oxygen conditions that that's then the ciliates are starting to take over. All of these protozoa live in the micro droplets or tiny films of water and soil. Uh, when you're, if you were to take a pond sample or, you know, a liquid sample of some type of in nature, um, even a puddle, you're going to see more uh, of these protozoa. And that's because they especially, or, or not especially, they live in water. So that's again, why moisture is important. Uh, one thing about protozoa is that uh, our red wigglers or any type of worms that we're using are mainly getting their nutrients from uh, these protozoa. So flagellates, amoeba, even ciliates, as worms munch through material, yes, they are taking in leaf matter and all ty other types of organic matter, but they're not really getting nutrients from the leaf litter, litter. They're getting nutrients from the microorganisms that are on that material. So the protozoa that is eating bacteria on services. So when people say that my worms love watermelon or my worms love pumpkin, what they actually love is the result of what the watermelon is doing to the uh, environment there. So you've got uh, sugars, which especially feed bacteria, and you've got moisture, which really feeds, which really helps bacteria to thrive and reproduce. So you've got moisture and sugar, which are going to help to really get those bacteria going. Once you really get those bacterial populations going from the moisture and the sugar in a watermelon, then that attracts their predators. So then you've got amoeba and flagellates moving in and consuming all these bacteria. And then what do worms love? What do worms get their nutrients from? All these protozoa, which have moved in to eat the bacteria, which were fed from the sugars and the moisture from the watermelon. So it's not the watermelon, it's the, repro it's the product or the results of what the watermelon has done in a bin. Uh, so these predator-prey relationships are gonna provide 
nutrient cycling. So again, uh, we eat a chicken sandwich. We've got those excess nutrients in us. We go for a swim in the ocean and a shark comes through and eats us and it poops us out. It's going to poop us out and release those nutrients that other things can then use them. Same thing on a microscopic scale. We've got bacteria and fungi that have consumed excess nutrients through decomposition of organic matter. And then their predators come along, munch on them, poop them out, and they're pooping them out in a plant available form. So before this, uh, the form of nutrients weren't available to plants, but after this, uh, due to this uh, reaction from this, they're able to then take up the nutrients that were in these microbes. So we're unlocking the nutrients, just like putting a lock in a key, we're putting the, we're providing all the life that needs to take place to cycle these nutrients. After protozoa, we've got nematodes. So bacteria, fungi, or decomposers, and then their predators are gonna be protozoa and nematodes. So uh, most people have heard of nematodes in a negative manner because uh, that's usually what all news talks about are the negative things rather than the positive things. But we, there are a lot more beneficial nematodes than there are uh, harmful nematodes. The parasitic nematodes, I need to take another drink of water. The parasitic nematodes are the root feeders, which cause root, they're called root knot nematodes, which cause root knots on certain types of crops and can really wipe out an entire field of crops. Um, and because of the, that, uh, negativity, then that's why they've gotten some na that, that's why all nematodes have gotten a bad name. But um, almost all nematodes that I see, I've only ever seen one root feeder. I've almost always see bacterial feeders, some fungal feeders, some predatory nematodes. So interesting fact about nematodes is that nematodes outnumber any other animal in the world, more than bears, more than lions, more than humans. There are more nematodes than any other thing, any other animal in the world, uh, out of the animals. So nematodes also live in the micro droplets or small films of water and soil. So again, moisture is always important. This is why mulching is important. I know I'm maybe getting a bit off topic from worm bins, but in your garden, uh, by using mulch or cover crops to keep soil moist, you're uh, keeping that moisture in the ground, which is gonna help to provide a lot better environment for all these microorganisms. So it's all about the habitat. When we have a worm bin or a compost pile, that's a habitat. It's all habitat for microorganisms. And um, so we need to consider it a habitat for microorganisms and worms. So uh, the most abundant of the nematodes, as I said, are bacterial feeders. If you look at the illustration here, the, the one on the far left is a bacterial feeder. So um, let's say nematodes look like and move through the soil like worms or snakes. So they're moving in a wriggling fashion and you'll see a picture and a video coming up of exactly what they look like or at least what one of them, some of them look like. Um, they are a, uh, crap, what is the term I was just thinking of? Um, nematode, nematode, uh, roundworm. They are a roundworm. So when you take your dog or cat to the vet and they do um, a test for roundworms, those roundworms are a type of nematode, not the same nematodes that we are working with in our soils and compost piles, but they're another type of nematode. Um, but they're all roundworms and they move as worms in the soil and most all are gonna be microscopic. So uh, back to this, bacterial feeders are gonna be consuming bacteria, releasing those nutrients um, they can have plain mouth parts. So I, I, what I started to say was that all of these are identified by, by their mouth parts, especially. So when I'm looking through a microscope, uh, I see a nematode and then I need to go back and get it to slow down so that I can view the mouth parts and see what I'm really dealing with to identify, to um, truly identify what type it is. So bacterial feeders can have really ornate lips. This one has somewhat ornate lips. Uh, I had a video, but it's it's hard to see on the video, so I didn't include it. But um, it has really floral lips, like kind of petals on a on a rose. Um, but again, so they have a plain or plain mouth system, no teeth, no anything else. Uh, sometimes their lips on the outside are ornate, 
And then they have a somewhat simple uh, digestive system where they'll have just one main tube with other organs that you'll see bacteria passing through. Fungal feeding nematodes are obviously going to feed on fungi. So it's hard to see here. Uh, I've got a photo coming up from the microscope, but they have what's called a stylet or a spear. So I'm pointing the arrow here at the mouth part that shows the little pointy section at the end. So they're going to use this stylet to stab out from their mouth, stab it into a cell of a fungal hyphae and suck out the nutrients. So just like a vampire bites somebody in the neck and sucks out the blood, they are stabbing into the cell wall of a fungi, uh, fungal hyphae, and sucking out the cell, uh, can't think of what that's called all of a sudden, uh, protoplasm from inside the cell uh, to gain nutrients from that. So those are the fungal feeders. The root feeders we identify, they have a similar stylet as the fungal feeders, but they have these two knobs at the end. So it's especially hard to stab a stylet into root hairs more than it is fungal hyphae um, due to the consistency of it. So they need extra strength and these little nodes down here are uh, extra muscles that help to jab out that stylet, stab into a root cell and a root hair and suck out the nutrients. So these are the parasitic uh, nematodes that are ruining some plants and, and uh, causing those root knots. So bacterial, fungal, root, and then we've got predatory nematodes. Uh, so predatory nematodes are gonna consume other nematodes. Uh, quick, real quick, bacterial feeding nematodes are gonna be the most, the smallest nematodes as they're just moving through eating bacteria. So uh, bacteria aren't very big, neither are their nematodes. Um, fungal feeders are gonna be somewhat bigger. Root feeders are gonna be somewhat bigger. And then predatory nematodes are gonna be the biggest of all because they eat other nematodes. So when I'm seeing a big honking nematode in a sample, I know that it's likely a predatory nematode, but what I need to identify it is the mouth part here and look for teeth. So they normally have just one tooth. Sometimes they'll have several small teeth, but most are gonna uh, see this tooth. Uh, so you'll see this dark part right here. Uh, again, I have a photo coming up, which I'll show you an example of that. And then uh, not as common, but sometimes you'll see omnivorous uh, nematodes, which are gonna be consuming uh, different types of things. So there'll be uh, this one shown is a fungal feeder that also eats bacteria and other things. So there's some pictures here. We've got um, likely a bacterial feeding nematode. So again, it looks like a worm or a snake. You've got the head part here. You've got the tail here. Sometimes they'll have a short stubby tail. Sometimes they'll have a really, really long thin tail. This one has about a medium uh, skinny tail here. And then you'll see the movement in just a second, but they're wiggling through a sample like this or wiggling through soil like that. Uh, and then you can't really see the organs in here, but this is a bunch of bacteria that it's consumed and it's moving through its digestive system. Let's see, hopefully this video plays. Crap. Uh, I don't know why it's not working as a video. Uh, this is supposed to be a video that shows you how the how it wriggles around, but uh, you can again see mouth part here. This one's a bit fatter, uh, and then it's got the tail here. And I apologize that I'm not able to play the video. I don't know why that's not working. So here we've got an example of a fungal feeding nematode. You can see the stylet here. So there's the point where this oil uh, arrow is pointing to at the very end and the stylet extends all the way down here. And then to distinguish this from the root feeding nematodes, this one doesn't have the little knobs at the bottom here. It's just a very straight stylet with the point at the end. So we know that that is a fungal feeder. Here's a fungal hyphae, funny, that is sitting right next to a fungal hyphae. All right, so this nematode, you're looking at the mouth part and using my arrow here, I'm pointing at the tooth part. I didn't include the arrow, uh, the design arrow on here, but you can see this tooth part. They're all, they also generally have a big boxy mouth. Uh, so this one, there's not a lot of space in the mouth here, but this one has this giant boxy mouth, which you could see better if it were a little more shadowed, but I, in order to get the picture, I had to... Uh, mess with the light and shadowing so that you could see the tooth on, tooth on this. But these are going to be moving through soils, 
<laughs> sucking in other nematodes and consuming them. And then lastly, here is the root feeding nematode. So it's hard to see. I, I was mainly trying to focus in on the knobs, so you can't see the stylet here or the pointy part of the stylet, but you can see that there is a stylet, and then it's got these two knobs at the end. So that is a root feeding nematodes and those are how those are distinguished. Next, uh, so we are moving up in the soil food web. I said we got bacteria, fungi, their predators, which are protozoa and nematodes. And then as we move up in the food chain, we've got microarthropods, arthropods, worms, and uh, other vertebrates and invertebrates. So uh, this here is a exoskeleton uh, of a dead, uh, Microarthropod, they look similar to a spider in that they have these eight legs, uh, and then they usually have these tiny little antenna type things. But this is a mite. So when people talk about mites, this is going to be a microscopic mite. Uh, they're a type of microarthropod. So most of what I'm seeing in soils are gonna, or in a microscope are going to be uh, mites like this. And then to bring it all together, um, so all these microorganisms and plants have had symbiotic relationships for eons before uh, humans were even on the earth. When plants uh, form these symbiotic relationships with bacteria and fungi in the soil in order to provide themselves with nutrients. So plants know how to manage their own nutrient needs. And for us, it's a matter of feeding the soil and getting the correct things in the soil for the soil to feed the plants. And this illustration uh, I borrowed from Elaine, uh, Elaine Ingham, um, who I used to work with. So this is a bunch of cakes and cookies on plant roots and in the tree. So this is an analogy to show through photosynthesis. Uh, plants are making extra proteins, carbohydrates, and sugars. So in our human forms of proteins, carbohydrates, and sugars, we've got proteins, milk, and eggs. Uh, carbohydrates is flour, sugars is simple table sugar, and if you mix those together, you make cakes and cookies. So the analogy is that in this symbiotic relationship, you've got any type of plant that shows a tree, but any type of tree, bush, garden plants that we grow, grass, any type of thing that's growing is photosynthesizing and making excess nutri uh, making excess foods, especially carbohydrates that they are putting out through their roots as root exudates or foods for microorganisms. So they're attracting bacteria and fungi to the root zone again for, to repeat. And then those bacteria and fungi are in place holding extra nutrients so that when they die or are consumed, they are then cycling nutrients to the plants. So plants are able to put out chemical signals to attract the nutrients and micronutrients that they need it's not that humans have to micromanage the nutrients for a plant. Plants know what they need. We need to provide the soil with what the plant needs so that the plants can get from the soil what the plants needs. Plants need, and they can manage their own nutrient needs. So focus on feeding the soil. That's where our, our vermicompost comes into play so we can feed, put back nutrients and good biology and organic matter through our vermicompost. Uh, so just to go over uh, other functions that perform, along with ones that I've already mentioned, but other functions that are performed, uh, soil food rub is attributed to a number of functions within soil. All these are essential for plant and soil health. So as I've been mentioning over and over again throughout our live stream here is that bacteria and fungi are going to be breaking down organic matter. So if it weren't for bacteria and fungi in the world, we would just have piles of organic matter littering everywhere. We'd have giant trees and all kinds of things that are just piling up and uh, not going anywhere, not turning into soil. So these are the recyclers in nature, breaking down organic matter and turning them to soil. So we've got the breakdown of organic matter and then through predator-prey relationships, we've got nutrient cycling taking place within soils. And then as bacteria and fungi are functioning, moving through soils, put, uh, releasing enzymes and acids. These enzymes uh, work as glues. So bacteria kind of work as uh, bricks and uh, fungi put the mortar together with the bricks and they perform structure within soils. So you've got more porous soils 
where you've got uh, good structure to them, good aggregation. So if you think about um, think about the beach, you don't have any soil, you don't have any structure when things are all sand, where the water goes through the sand and just pours right out. Where in the opposite, if you've got a clay soil, clay is going to be super compact and you're not going to have any drainage or you're likely to not have much drainage if it's super clay. And if we've got a nice loam in the middle where we've got a good amount of sand, good amount of clay, but not too much of either one, plus some organic matter, um, then we've got this soil structure. So biology is what helps to create the soil structure using organic matter uh, through the litter layer. So with this improved structure, porosity, and aggregation, we're going to have the retention of water and nutrients. So this, um, with the help of soil biology, we're turning soils into a giant sponge. So especially in the past several years, we've, we're having a climate where heavy downpours are the norm rather than just, you know, average rainfalls that come in here and there. We've either got heavy downpours or times with just no water. So microorganisms having life in the soil is going to help to keep that water in the soil, help it hold it there for these dry times when plants can then uptake them when we're in a drought period. Along with everything else, having all this beneficial life in the soil, we're ha we have a good security force that are going to protect plants by outcompeting diseases and pests. So in the soil and on foliage of plants, we've got all these beneficial life that are just basically like a security force. You know, if you think about armed guards all the way around a building, that's what they're doing. There's, you know, so many, so many bodies in place that uh, outcome that the diseases and pests aren't going to be able to even penetrate and uh, cause harm. Or, and by also having uh, beneficial life, providing healthier plants, then you're less likely to even have disease and pests who want to move in. So those are all of the functions performed, and I believe we're at the Q&A now. So I'm going to go back to the main screen so I can see all of your questions. And let me get back way up here so I can start at the first question. Thanks again, everybody, for joining in. Um, somebody said, so growing food needs ideal pH between 6.5 to 7. Been adding mycorrhizal fungi and compost to the soil in my market garden is a bad idea because it brings lower pH. Um, no, so this soil biology isn't going to lower lower the pH to a point where plants are going to grow. It's going to maintain. It's just going to be a slightly lower than neutral normally, where it's more acidic conditions rather than neutral or alkaline conditions. Um, so yeah, uh, and just because you're adding spores of mycorrhizal fungi doesn't mean that they're necessarily taking off, but um, they're going to be benefiting the plant. And yes, uh, at a certain point in soils, if you've got mycorrhizal fungi incorporated, if there's way more fungi in the soil, then it's going to be slightly acidic because of all the fungi that's in the soil. So um, important point is that soil biology dictates soil chemistry. So the biology is what is going to create the conditions that form the chemistry or the pH. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see, what other questions do we have here? I've got a good amount of comments, so I'm just trying to read through them quickly. Some of them aren't necessarily questions. Keep in mind that mycorrhizae is only beneficial if it makes direct contact to roots, so that's why it's good to apply to the roots. Uh, yeah, that, so in our, uh, in my blog post today, or it, sorry, it came out yesterday, um, mycorrhizal spores need to be within a few millimeters of roots to uh, detect chemical signals from the roots. So it's, um, that's why it can be a waste of money just to purchase soil mix that have spores already incorporated because a lot of those spores aren't even going to come close to the roots. Uh, someone asked, so is it a good idea to have seeds sprouting in the worm bag to encourage roots? Um, seeds sprouting are a good thing in numerous ways because then you're not going to have those seeds sprouting in your garden once you apply the vermiculture to your garden. But yes, if you've got uh, roots growing from seeds that are sprouting, those roots are going to help to provide uh, more foods for 
uh, bacteria and fungi, especially bacteria in a worm bin. So you're going to get more, um, uh, more microbial activity. Uh, I've got a really cool example on my Living Roots Compost Tea Instagram page from a while back. Um, I show a video where I've got a compost pile that's been aging for several months and breaking down. And you can see where there was some plants that had grown into the compost pile. And what's really interesting is we've got compost that don't, don't have any plant roots in them. And just inches away, there have some, been some plants that have taken over on top of the compost. So I dig up, I pull up the roots or pull up the plants to expose the roots and the compost where those roots had been is broken down even farther because of the activity of the feeding. Those plants have released exudates to feed microorganisms and due to the increase in microorganisms, it's increased the decomposition in that area where the plants were. We're just right next to it where there weren't any plants you can see that it's the same exact compost, but it's a slightly bit chunkier because there hasn't been quite as much uh, microbial activity being fed through those plant roots. Uh, so it's a really good example of how that works and why plants are important. So this is that's one reason why it's good to use cover crops in a garden rather than having bare soil. Um, if you've got bare soil in a garden or farm, you're likely gonna be losing a lot of that to rainwater and erosion, but if you've got plants in place, you're not going to only you're not only going to be holding that soil in place with the roots, but you're going to always be feeding soil biology by having living roots in the ground. And so that's one of the five soil principles. If you've ever uh, learned about the five soil principles, that's one of the important uh, important ones is living roots in the soil because you're feeding that soil biology. Um, not seeing many more questions. Let me go down here. Someone said cool picks. Do mites break down manure? Oh, hey, Justin. Um, mites are going to be chewing through any organic matter. So um, they're, that is going to include manure. Um, what's mainly going to be feed, fed uh, by the manure is going to be bacteria. Uh, so when you use manure and compost piles, that really gets things to heat up. And the reason that it's heating up is because you're increasing the bacteria so much and that bacterial activity is what's creating those temperatures. Uh, and with, with each, uh, again, so going back to the watermelon thing, I mentioned watermelon feeding bacteria, feeding protozoa. So each level, when you incorporate certain things, so manure is going to be similar to the watermelon is that manure is going to be feeding bacteria, a lot of bacteria, which is going to help an increase in bacteria, which is going to help an increase of the next trophic level, which is going to help an next increase of the next trophic level. So as humans, if we don't have foods to eat, we're going to diminish. But the more and more foods we have to eat, the more we're able to expand our populations. If we didn't have foods, we wouldn't be able to expand our population. So if we're eating, as long as there's lower trophic levels and the more of them, then the more populations of other things. So mites are likely in there with that as well. And da -da -da -da. comments, but not any questions here. Let me see if I find more questions. If my soil is lacking nematodes, what species should I add? Um, if the soil is lacking nematodes, it's likely due to a disturbance of the soil. So moving towards a no-till system is going to help to bring back nematodes. It's not necessarily a matter of inoculating your soil with nematodes, um, but making the conditions right. So if you purchase a dog or a cat or you get a pet and you bring them home, you make sure that you have a home, you make sure that you have food, you make sure that you have water. If you bring a cat home and you don't provide anything for them, they're likely just going to run away or not stay there. So same thing with our microorganisms. We're trying to create a home. We're trying to create a habitat for these microorganisms. And so we have to review uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What's the very basic thing? Physical needs, shelter, food, and water. So we need to provide shelter, food, and water for these microorganisms. So uh, build it and they will come. And that includes nematodes. So incorporate more, more variety, 
of organic matter um, through composts or cover crops, and then you're gonna be attracting these nematodes and make sure that things are staying moist because they need moisture. And uh, somebody said, have a great Thanksgiving, you as well, thank you. Although I'm spending it all by myself this year, being a single dad. Um, let's see, it says the animals the manure came from may have had dewormers and antibiotics, let manure sit for, uh, yes, that's a good point again is, if you are, uh, since someone mentioned manures, when we're including manures in compost piles or vermicompost bins, it's good to, to not include anything that has been taking dewormers. Uh, so horses are especially prone to taking dewormers or ant antibiotics. And we are trying to promote life and uh, build up the life rather than kill it. And these things are gonna be working against us. So thank you for that addition in the comment there. Um, one of my bins, I used a lot of wood chips thick with saprophytic mycelia in the bottom. Many worms migrated there and have absolutely proliferated. Yeah, uh, you will notice that. So mycelium is going to help to provide this good ho home for that nematodes and other protozoa are going to really love and the worms are going to feed off of those things. And um, uh, Louise from uh, Wormies, um, he's not likely listening to this, but he was talking at the worm conference a few years ago and he had noticed when he incorporates uh, wood chips, more wood chips into his bin, he gets more cocoon production. So uh, just kind of a side comment, but that's one more thing to consider too when incorporating wood chips into your worm bin. Uh, but with that, we are out of questions. Uh, unless I get one in the next few, in the next few seconds here, uh, I'm gonna bid you adieu and thank you for joining in. I uh, appreciate everyone being here. Uh, for those of you in the U.S., again, have a good Thanksgiving. And uh, we're coming up on our holiday season. Uh, next week, I'll be back. I'm planning, I was hoping to do this week on worm anatomy. But being out of town, uh, I just needed more information to be able to put that together. And uh, I was in Jamaica, and I was able to, you know, I've got all this information easy in my head, and I could put this together for you. But um yeah, so next week should be worm uh, worm anatomy. So learn all the parts of the worm and what they do, or at least most parts of the worm. So hopefully I'll see you then. Thanks for joining in. Uh, tell your friends, subscribe on YouTube, and uh, happy Wiggle Wednesday. Thanks, everybody. Have a blessed day.